Hi, it's Tim. Welcome to the channel. This is an LC630. It's a Macintosh from the early 1990s. It has a 68040 CPU in it and it was sold to me as working. It also had a front plate on it, but the vendor had an interesting attitude towards um, packaging. And it's now an airfix kit. But I'm sure we can do something with this. Maybe we'll even get it to work. Should we have a look? Come on. I'd like to thank PCB Way for sponsoring this video. Here are a couple of PCBs that I've just received from them. This is one that I designed myself. I uploaded the Gerber files to the um, PCBWay.com and this is what came back. This is a shared project. It's a modulator replacement board and it is by fellow YouTubers, The Retro Channel. And we're going to be building this on the channel at some point in the future. If you want to build a shared project or you have your own PCB designs that you want to produce, then uh, check them out, www.pcbway.com. Now back to the video. So to get into this thing, what we do basically is on the back, push down these two tabs and lift off the panel. Now this here is a cunning little handle. And what we do is we unscrew these two screws. Modern day Apple, please take note, these are ordinary Phillips head screws. Isn't this easy? Easy. And then you pull the handle. And the motherboard and a load of dust and grime slides out. Plus inside are a couple of extra bits of plastic. Hopefully those are from the front panel. Don't know if you'll be able to see that. Inside is the ribbon cables and connectors and stuff and there's fans in the top. And getting into the rest of the computer is supposedly a lot more difficult. We shall come to that, I think, later. So let's have a look at the motherboard. Okay, first thing we notice is it's got a 68 LC040. That can, I understand, that can be upgraded to or replaced with a full 68040 chip to make this effectively a Quadra rather than an LC. Might be a fun project in the future to see what difference it would make. Uh, board looks fairly clean. Um, it's dusty. It's got dust bunnies in there and grot. That's four megabytes of onboard RAM. That's an extra RAM card of however much that is. This is a video input card, which corresponds with these RCA sockets on the back. Uh, red, white, yellow, which have presumably the usual meanings, i.e. stereo sound and composite video. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight capacitors which we will want to change because they are inherently leaky. And the elephant on the board, battery. If this hasn't leaked, it's gonna leak. So it's coming off. It doesn't look like it's leaked, which is a fortunate thing that maybe no way of telling its age. It may be a replacement battery, but we don't need it. Doesn't look, it doesn't feel sticky. Doesn't look like there's been any leakage. I like this idea that it's just, um, what's the word? Thing, stuff. So the job to do on this is to change the capacitors and clean the board just to get rid of the dust. Not sure what that switch is for. Probably a reset or something. I would guess this card just comes out. 
and of course there's a screw on the back Hyundai Korea so let's get the anti-static brush out and just give it a quick scrape down to get the worst off <laughs> now I have got a capacitor kit or at least I have bought a set of capacitors so we can go through and we can swap those out let's do that shall we so I've got my capacitors and I've made a little diagram of where each capacitor is, what value it is, what way round it is, including compulsory mistakes. Okay, so rather than cutting them off, I am going to try the soldering iron and rocky rocky. I don't hold much hope that it's going to be a better solution, but we'll give it a go. I think they've actually glued those down. As for this alleged, it doesn't put any strain on the PCB, I don't believe that for a minute. These legs are breaking as much as they're not breaking. And if they're breaking, that means that it's getting a strain. That one smells fishy. That one just pulled straight out and left the leg behind. Okay, so those are off. Let's now try and unstick the glued down bits of plastic. So the board is cleaned up and I've got most of the glue off. Now, unfortunately, we do have one casualty and that is the positive end of capacitor C3. It does go to a little tiny veer just there, but it's too thin. Well, no, it's not too thin for the thinnest wire that I've got, but it is blocked by um, solder mask or some sort of gunge in there. In fact, they all are. So you can't see through any of these tiny, tiny little veers. So I can't put a new capacitor on there until I can figure out where that plus end goes and then run a bodge wire to it. But we can get on with the others. 100 microfarads, 6 volts. Now, we need three of those, but one of those is C3, so we just need two for now. And they are this one C8 and this one C7. 
So the first one we'll do C8 to start with. That side's the positive side, that side's the negative side. The little bar goes on the negative side. So what I'll do is I'll apply some solder to that. Melt it. And then I just need to solder the other side. There we go. both of those, put the rest back in the bag. It's always a good idea to buy too many. All the others are 47s. Finally, there we go. So just that one to do, and I need to find where that bodge wire needs to go to. And I need to for this last one, what I'm going to do is run a wire from this via here, which is electrically connected to where this pad was but there's, it's got a, um, a better hole and a better connection. And you solder that into that via and then solder onto that. So I've already put the wire into the via and taped it down. So I just need to tack it down with some solder. Let's add a little flux. I think that's attached. Take the wire, take the tape off and see if it wants to... Yeah, that seems to be attached. I'll put the tape over that side, which will make sure that it is secured like that. So it's not going to go anywhere when we solder it. And then... Uh... And once again, tin the pad. Now this is going to be awkward, so... There we go. I've cleaned the board up, but I've left a bit of captain tape just over there just to protect it. Add a sticker to say what we've done. Now where shall we put that? Yeah. There we go. So we know what we've done and anybody else knows what we've done. 
Now we can put it back together. So let's add some um, contact cleaner into there and into that. And the RAM card can go back and the video card can go back. Take that screw out and put the screw back into the card so that whoops so that I wouldn't lose it. So let's just take that out. And that can go back in. Turn him around and Turn it back a little notch so that it doesn't try and cut a new thread. There we go. Let's continue disassembling this machine because you can see it's pretty crusty and we want to at least clean it and also look at the power supply and so on. Now, we don't have to worry about taking the front cover off because, well, it's broken. So, we should be able to take the top off just by sliding it forwards. in theory. Ah. And that takes this plate here off. Let's try that. I don't see any screws holding this uh, top plate on, but you never know. Ah, there we go. And then these will just come out once that's off. I'm going to need to take them outside and get rid of the... Ooh, ooh, that's the screw from there. And that's another piece of plastic, which actually could have come from these side panels, because that's broken as well. In fact, yes, it looks like, looking at this side panel, that looks like one of these clips. So it's going to go there, I would guess. Need to be careful with that. To get this top off, we have two screws at the back. This is filthy. Look at this. Okay, so it should just pull off. Now we have to be careful because the floppy drive cable loops through the top. So if we unplug the floppy Oops. You can unloop it from the cable. And that just clips under there. God, it's filthy. So we've got the top off. We've got a floppy drive. Get from the hard drive, which is a SCSI, plugs into there. This is the um, RF tuner card, fan, power supply, video board. 
it's absolutely filthy in here. It'll all need cleaning. How do we get the floppy drive out? Oh, I think that just slides through there. Okay, so that's that's the floppy drive. It's just screwed onto this plate. It's filthy. And this is the hard drive. It's not at all well secured. Just uh, okay, it's got a rail that is broken. So Plug the drive. I believe it is an IDE drive, so I'm going to suspect it. Uh, 350 megabytes. There's a certain amount of rattling going on there, which is kind of worrying. There's more bits of plastic. If that is IDE, we may be able to replace that with an SD, um, not an SD card, a compact flash. So this should just pull out, and it does. Here we go. It's the switch unit and ribbon cable. Then the TV tuner card. Actually, let's. that off. Two screws at the back. And it just slides out. More dust will take the fan out. Two screws. These are long screws. The whole assembly comes away. And this plugs into the power supply which we can unplug there. That unclips from that. This entire back comes off. We're getting there. Two more screws to go. There's one screw down here. This comes out. Then in order to get this metal out at the front, we're going to have one final screw. That, what's that? What's that? So that's the main motherboard connector to all these bits of wires and stuff. It's held on with Velcro. Ah, oh, it's a speaker. Ah, uh, right. So I am going to get the cleaning stuff out on this and just clean it up. You don't want to see that. I don't want to see that. I just want to go and it's done. Okay, so I've cleaned up the chassis and put the trays back in. And in the process, I've actually glued together the base of the hard drive. It's still still rattles rather worryingly so I'm not convinced that this is going to actually work again but I've glued the rails together I'm not convinced that they're going to hold it did at least show that we've got most of the pieces I couldn't find that little corner there and this end and this end are glued on but I have 3d printed a replacement for that in any case so yeah this is an IDE interface, so we can put in a compact flash adapter. That's an alternative if we got if this hard drive doesn't work. And to be honest, I'm not too worried if this hard drive doesn't work. Now, the fan and the other bits cleaned up quite nicely. The power supply 
is still grotty. I haven't dared go inside that at the moment. That is, I'll show you this, this is, this is the top shield that goes, sits there like that. And this is actually heat scorching from the power supply. So, I mean, it will it will come off eventually, but the the brushing that I gave it outside it didn't want to come off. Um, I will clean it up properly and get rid of that. But it does show that this power supply has been kicking out a lot of heat, and I think those capacitors in there are well in need of replacing. So they've probably dried out. I don't see any reefers, but you never know. Anyway, so that's going to be our next job is to strip down this power supply and replace the capacitors. So let's get on with that. So let's take this apart. I don't know when the last time was it was powered on. Certainly I haven't plugged it in. But that doesn't mean that nobody did. So we're going to have to make sure that the capacitors are shorted out and discharged. Three screws holding it down there and two screws holding this heat shield onto the to the back. Should slide out. There we go, there's some plastic insulation under there. Okay, so that should be anything shorted out that could be shorted out. Just give it a dust down with the brush. Okay, so we have to replace these capacitors with fresh ones. Okay so being silly I have bought capacitors for the wrong power supply. This is in fact a Dynocomp DCF704. You can actually see it just says there DCF704. And the capacitors that I've got are not the right values so I'm just going to put it back together I think.
also let us put that back in the case. So let's see if I can figure this out. This goes in this way around. Like that, and there is one screw down there. That goes in there, that goes in there, like that. Now this clips into there, clips into there, like that, that goes into there. goes into there. The fan goes into here like that. And that goes in there. This will just slide back in as it came out. Uh, that's at the bottom. And the cable goes in that way around. And we can put the RF output card in here. And two screws. I'm going to put the hard drive in full knowledge that it's likely to fail. Look at that, it slides in. And the CD-ROM drive, now that just slides in to the back plane. There we go. Now the floppy should go in next, but I want to take that apart and just check that it needs cleaning on the inside. So let's do that. Floppy, this should be more or less the same as an Amiga drive. So, let's take it off its mounting tray. And it's a Sony drive. Top plate should probably just unclip. There we go. And the mechanism is more or less the same as an Amiga mechanism or a 1581 or a PC drive. We've still got some dust and grot inside. I don't know if you can see it, there are two little micro switches there. There and there. Which govern the right protect tab and whether it's a hot HD disc or not. These two screws should take off this front bezel. There we go, so we can clean inside here. The head is not going to move without turning that worm drive, which needs the motor. There are two motors in this. That is for the eject, which is, um, I'm not sure unique to Apple floppies, but the normal eject mechanism doesn't come out to a button like on a Commodore drive or a Amiga drive, ST drive, etc. 
Instead, it's electrically driven by this little motor. Okay. Oops. Oh, well, now it's off. Let's just clean the heads. Heads themselves seem pretty clean, but now it's free of the mechanism that will slide. Okay, so we want to clean this grease off. Clean that rail as well. Okay, so just a little bit of silicone grease on there. Should be enough just to lubricate that. Okay, that's the floppy drive. So this, once we plugged in the floppy, Slide in on those rails, tuck that through there. And that's it, we just need to put the motherboard in and we should be ready to test it. Once we get a cable for the video feed. It's on order, it just has not arrived yet. So now we're going to put the motherboard in. And it really is just a matter of sliding it all around, pushing it home. We can screw it in, but I'm not going to do that just for the moment. We're going to try it first. And so the moment of truth. I've got my VGA adapter, which goes into the back. Three mile cable goes into the back. Mouse two inch cable goes into the back. Mains is live. The power switch is actually at the back. a good start. Stuff is rattling. But I don't know at the moment whether there's no video being output or whether the TV is not displaying VGA. It's definitely on the VGA input. However, we definitely had signs of trying to boot. Or at least signs of disk activity. The caps lock light comes on when I press the caps lock so at least something is working. Okay so I tried another monitor and that didn't work and then I was chatting to some guys on Jan Beta's discord and they said that the VGA adapter cable needs to have some configuration done on it. There are three pins on this 15 pin cable called sense pins that determine what the resolution is of the monitor that the Mac is connected to. And the monitor sends back signals that are appropriate to whatever resolutions it can display. Now 
this cable or this adapter as it was sent to me didn't have any configuration and so it was determined that it was telling the Mac that the resolution that it was required to put out was higher than the resolution that the Mac was capable of and so the Mac said yeah nah not going to bother so I've wired up the cable so that two of the pins are shorted out and that should tell it that the monitor is actually a standard VGA 640 by 480 which I know that these monitors can display. I want to thank Ingo, Crocodile and Spoxbeer on Jan Beta's Discord for giving me the ideas to uh, sort out this adapter fix and uh, get this thing working. While I had the soldering iron out I decided to take this uh, three battery AA battery holder and fit the connector from the little square battery onto it so that we can put some NICADs, it not, they're not NICADs anymore are they? Um, rechargeable so we can put some rechargeable batteries gives us a PRAM back because the little cube batteries um, that this was designed for are very very expensive now on eBay they are something like 45 quid for a little four and a half volt battery that is ridiculous so a quid for one of these and about six quids worth of batteries so let me just put this cable back together and we'll plug it in and give it a try LC630 test with modified video adapter. Look at that. We have a happy Mac face. Welcome to Mac OS. The reason I've got the notepad over the power supply is simply so that I don't electrocute myself because I've done that before and it's not something you want to repeat. Okay, the mouse is not doing anything. It's probably plugged into the wrong place. Aha! Mouse plugged into wrong thing. There we go, Macintosh. System software 7.6.1, built in memory 8 megabytes, total memory 24 and a half megabytes. Hundred and eighty-four megabytes available. This is a two hundred and fifty-six megabyte hard drive, so that seems to be about right. Well there we have it, we can put the case back together now. Okay, so the final assembly now.
it's all back together now and you'll see I've actually got the mouse plugged into the correct hole. The front bezel is sort of repaired. It doesn't particularly fit very well. I think another time if I was doing um, another repair of that, maybe repair it while it's actually attached. Anyhow, possibly it could be stuck or taped or something. But it needs, it needs cleaning. Maybe I shall paint it. I don't know quite what I'll do with it. And the mouse and the keyboard obviously need cleaning. So we'll fire it up and put it through its paces. Uh, three, two, one, go. So it's up and it's running. Now I haven't shown you the CD-ROM or the floppy drive actually working. So this is not Mac software. This is in fact a Windows copy of Mist. So it's not going to work, but it's a standard CD. So the drive opens up. read standard format CDs and there it comes up on the screen. So we can open that and we can see what's on the disk. There we go. It's all Windows stuff. To reject it, we just drag it to the trash and out it comes. Similarly for the floppy drive, this is PC format disk, 1.44 megabytes. nothing on it and to reject it you just drag it onto the trash and out it comes. This is a Mac formatted disk that I formatted earlier on. Called it imaginatively Mac And we can write to it by loading up, say, Microsoft Word. Not entirely imaginative, but there you go. That's just a document. And we can save that. And there it is on the disk. And of course we can eject that in the same way. So that's it, my first Mac LC630, 68040 Mac. Thank you for watching. If you got any suggestions of what I can install on it, what I can do with it, what cards are available for it, maybe um, it has a processor direct slot. So it could take what network cards, maybe accelerator cards. Anyway, please like and subscribe to the channel. It helps with the algorithms and all the YouTube -y things. And I look forward to seeing you another time. So thanks for watching. See ya.